terms of uh, work balance. Uh, because at that moment in time, I just left my retail gig and I was getting back into the swing of things of, you know, just finding work and taking on projects. And I was super heavy on just work, 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 work. I don't need to sleep. I just need to work as much as possible. And I really didn't take a whole lot of time out for myself. And I just started experiencing burnout and it it got so bad where i would work super hard and then i'll come home and i would literally f like walk through the kitchen after getting out the car and just pass out in the middle of the kitchen and just like it it looks like i i just like been murdered <laughs> i'm like like just super tired and it can easily play into what you do like your work um you can get sloppy at work you can you know miss a detail you can forget a thing you can be doing something relatively dangerous like being on a ladder and then if you lose your balance it's like one of those things where like you have to have that balance where yes it's good to have a good you know strong work ethic but at what cost like don't overwork yourself to the point where you're physically you know falling asleep and then i was driving a bunch and just like i remember one time like i i literally fell asleep like at the wheel and like i'm so tired just working like up at eight back at 10 p.m and just like just take time to you know relax don't overwork yourself um just be patient like everything doesn't have to get done in an instant um but yeah just the same as you know setting expectations with people you're working with or working for your team your your clients um setting realistic expectations and timeline not only for them but for yourself is it cool to be shooting in a room that i've created um yeah, of course, man. Like everything that I do, I told my mentor this uh, a, a few months back. I went to a uh, to a house that I had worked on a project with him. We did some uh, security camera installs, and he got a call back to get some more uh, work done at that same spot, and called me to you know do some grunt work and you know run cables through a crawl space and attic. And uh, he was like, yeah, do you remember this house? I was like, I remember every house. And he was like, I like that. I was like, yes, get some points. But um, but yeah, like I, rem I remember like, you know, all the projects and things that I work on, like I, I take pride in what I do to the point where it's just like, I try to remember as much details about everything as, as much as possible. So that way um, it doesn't feel like it's work. You know what I mean? It. I just wanted to, I want, yeah, it's, it's a way of making money and stuff like that, and it's a career, but um, it's something that I care about so much to the point where I, I, I want it to be the thing that, you know, is the hallmark of, you know, my lifetime and, you know, or one, at least one of those things. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, a lot of projects and a lot of different, you know, clients and people that I work with and, you know, mentors and people I meet along the way and uh I hope I never forget you know a single project but yeah it's pretty cool um doing an interview in an area that I built up and you know seeing it come to life and then being in it is pretty pretty tight pretty awesome what's the scariest thing I've come across in a crawl space um i was in this one crawl space this guy's attic uh out by like fort washington super cool dude he has like huge huge like pit bulls um really friendly dogs and uh i was doing some some work and i had to run some uh some cable from his uh garage where the circuit breaker was to the um to the outside of uh the side of his house but it had to go through the attic and i crawled up there and it was like a humongous possum 
and it's like pitch black in crawl spaces, <laughs> like in attics. You can't see anything besides whatever your your flashlight or any ambient light is pointed at. Um, and there's no windows. So I'm like looking around, I'm trying to like, you know, find like the path to walk from where I'm at to where I need to be. And I just see like these glowing eyes staring back at me. I'm like, that's a either an animal or a demon. And I'm not trying to uh, figure out which one's which. So I was like, yeah, there's something up there. Then we heard it crawling around a little bit. Took my phone out and sure enough, it was a big old possum. So he had a call, animal control. I came back a couple of days later once it was gone. So, but yeah, that, that was uh, not a fun time for me. Oh, these ones, um, what are the name of these sneakers? These are the uh, Jordan 6 DMP. Uh, defining moment packs. Um, it's actually one of two, um, but these are the Jordan Six silhouettes. Uh, but these came out as like a commemoration to like um, the run that uh, Jordan did. Uh, so for its three peat. Uh, but yeah, this was a. Uh, this is probably like one of my favorite shoes. I have this. I have the Carmine Sixes. I have the. Uh, uh the the ones the, the lime green ones uh these uh the fire uh i have quite a few i have quite a few of these uh the infrared uh sixes um but yeah i, I just like the silhouette just because um it's so much you know on the court off the court history behind it um i don't know if it was you that was telling this but um the michael keaton batman uh, like the OG Batman, uh, when they were designing his uh, his bat suit, uh, Tinker Hatfield actually designed the boots, which is based on the silhouette for the Jordan uh, Jordan Six. So if you ever go back and watch Batman and you look at his shoes, they are just like a boot version of the Jordan Sixes. Uh, an everyday pair. What does it mean to be an everyday pair? Uh, just something that you can just throw on if you have to go, you know, run errands or something like that. But you know that it's like your kind of your go to shoe or it's like a um, just a solid, not necessarily like a beater, but um, just something that you want to, you know, feel comfortable wearing that kind of like goes with anything you you know wear. Um, you know, it could be like a, you know, a very, very common shoe like you know, like the pandas or something like that. Or it could be something like, you know, a fresh pair of, you know, forces, like, you know, crispy white ones or, um, but for me, it's always gonna be something like, you know, like this or like, uh, you know, my Jordan nines, which I, my second favorite shoe, uh, or at least I would say top five uh, shoe that I, I really, really love. But uh, everyday shoe, yeah. Uh, it's just like throw it on, go do what you gotta do, look fly, look cool. Um, especially with these, like not too many people like have these. I haven't seen too many people you know wear these out and about. But uh, I don't know. That's another thing. You know, wear your shoes. Like shoes are meant to be worn. Like I don't, I don't believe in just like keeping the shoes like in a box or in storage or something like that. Just you know, you got them, wear them. Ooh, it's sad to see him go, but like, you know, everything has an expiration date, you know, us included. It's not, I, don't, I try not to, you know, think about it too much and like, oh, you should have done this, but because eventually it's, it's going to happen. You know, one day those shoes are going to be unwearable. So, you know, wear them while you can, but I guess like hearing that, it always... I get the, you know, just the urge to go through uh, my collection and just look at some of the shoes that I maybe haven't worn in a while um, and just, you know, pull up the, you know, whatever the coolest memory I can have of, you know, when I got them, you know, anything significant happened while I was wearing them or stuff like that. And it just brings back a bunch of memories, you know, some good, some bad, but I usually try to focus on the good ones. 
Uh, I think it has to do with a lot with uh, just, you know, American culture, black culture. Um, why is it, why is the Jordan shoe so appreciated? It definitely has to come from, I guess like for me, I'm just gonna answer for me. Um, it just comes from a sense of like, you know, growing up, we always didn't have, you know, everything available to us. Everything wasn't, you know, handed to us. Um, what we did have, you know, my mom, my brother, my sister, you know, had to work for it. And it was like, it was, it was, it was one of those things where like, you feel so bad about yourself that like, you know, you feel like you're not a part of something. You want to just be included in it. And especially growing up in the 90s where Jordan, he's just like, you know, scoring, you know, crazy numbers, doing crazy numbers, you know, on the basketball field. He's like, man, I want to be just like him. I got to get those shoes. And, you know, that's where that statement, it must be the shoes just to like, you know, fit in with all the other kids. And then like you realize, you know, you don't have enough money or your mom doesn't have enough money. Or your parents don't have enough money to get you those you know, pair of Jordans when you're a kid and it's just like, ah, you just feel bad about yourself. But like, as an adult, I, I, I get that like, you know, there were priorities. Um, certain things had to be done uh, to maintain the household. And, you know, the coolest, latest pair of sneakers was definitely the lowest thing on the list. So, you know, other things had to come before that, but then getting older, just going through all the you know different shoes and seeing things release or re-release you know retros and stuff like that you know just you know treat yourself and then you, I, I developed that that appreciation for like man these are shoes I always wanted when I was a kid and you know I, I had such a great fondness for them and you just like appreciate them you take care of them um, yeah you just like it's just like you, you you care about it so much and you feel like you're a part of it now and then you're you know 20 pairs deep and then like you have a cool thing to you know start a conversation with and you know there's so many cool people that i ran into just randomly and the first thing we started talking about was shoes like oh man i like your shoes like, oh man i like your shoes too like and then lo and behold like oh man what do you do it's like oh yeah i'm this i'm that and it's like man this is like all this because of a pair of shoes and don't get me wrong there's there's been its ups and downs with like you know people doing crazy things for pairs of shoes but like for the most part just like you know you meet another sneakerhead and then you just like start chopping it up and it's just like man like how did this even become a thing and it's just like you know you don't the the, the cost of entry to the subculture isn't super high but like you know it's it's worth every penny to me uh i don't think it's it's gonna mean too much different than what you're already doing especially if you uh if you have a good attitude or uh the right mentality behind it um you know i talked a lot about uh you know some of these things with uh with my you know partner shout out chloe um you know just becoming a parent and things like that you know both of our lives are going to change uh you know drastically and you know, certain things have to go away. We have to unlearn certain things, but we have to learn a lot of new things. Um, and just checking in with her and making sure she's good. But uh, yeah, just being a, becoming a dad soon. Uh, it's 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 very very emotional and just like I'm just oof. It it's scary. It's nerve wracking. It's it's amazing. It's like it just makes you a little bit anxious and it's just like, man, but I know once I, you know, hold my kid, it's, it's going to be, you know, worth every, you know, gray hair on my head. Um, and you know, we got nothing but time and I can't wait to, uh, can't wait to meet him and, you know, hold his little hands. And, you know. but the one thing I always uh, think about and, um, just, uh, this is kind of like in reference to a phone call that I had with a, a, a uh, we were, for instance, like we were like two years old and, um, you know, I was telling them, you know, we reconnected recently uh, and I was telling him, yeah, I'm having a kid. And 
he's like, how you feeling, man? How you feel about that? And that was the first, the first thing that anybody had talked to me or asked me uh, when news broke about that. You know, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? And I was like, damn, how do I feel about that? And it was like a such a simple question, but it was like very deep um, because I had to, I had to ask myself, like, how do I feel about that? Um, it, it just stops being about me and it's more about, you know, my child. And I'm just like, man, I can't wait to see what he's like, what he's into, you know, what kind of adventures he's going to go on, like, who's going to be his best friend, like, what, like, is he going to want to do some of the stuff that I did when I was a kid, like, you know, like, you know, so I'm just excited. That's uh, probably the, the, the number one go-to response, I guess, at this point. I'm, you know, outside of being nervous, which I think everyone can agree, like having a kid is like no one's ever not nervous. But yeah, I'm just excited, man. I just want to see his little little fingers. Is you know, if he's gonna have a bald head or if he's gonna have curly hair, if he's you know gonna have my complexion, if he's gonna be you know lighter skin, is he gonna you know be super patient? Is he gonna be like you know, loud, or is it going to be, like, super quiet, and, yeah, man, I can't wait, cannot wait, what's the greatest thing about the partner that I'm with right now, um, I would probably say it's, I don't know, she's very, very understanding, um, when it comes to, with certain things, um, reasoning and conflicts and things like that. She's very, very understanding. Um, there's been moments where like things have been my fault or the, you know, the cause of conflict. And then there's been things that have been largely on her that have been like the reason why we butt heads. Um, but she's always solution oriented in that you know, no one's perfect or, you know, yes, we all make mistakes or things like that. Um, but she's not going to like beat me up about it. And she's not going to be like, oh, well, you should have done this or you should have done that. Blah, 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 blah. Sometimes she does that. But, um, <laughs> but we won't talk about those parts. Um, but no, she, uh, yeah, she's very reasonable when it comes to a lot of things. And um, a while back, there was something where uh, she kind of like, you know, we had our, you know, we butted heads and then, you know, exchanged words and things like that. And then, you know, we leave the room, just like leave the scene of the crime. And then, <laughs> and then she comes back to me like 20, 30 minutes later after the dust has settles and she's like, you know what? You know, I do see how, like, things could have been different or how you feel about this particular thing. Yada, yada, yada. I'll try and do better in these aspects. And she'll, like, give examples, which I think is, like, a lot of, like, forward thinking or uh, feed forward, I, I guess is the, the term. Um, because a lot of people can say, like, oh, I apologize for, you know, uh, calling you stupid. Um, but in that example, she can say something like that and she'll say, Hey, I'm sorry for calling you stupid in the future. If I get upset, I'm going to say, I don't like the way you think or something like, you know what I mean? Like she'll, she'll have like a, like an alternative to whatever is the reason behind the conflict. And I think that that's, uh, very thoughtful and, you know, I've, I've never really had a partner like that. Um, and, you know, I'm very much, you know, the same way when it comes to, uh, especially like relationships, um, not that relationships are one big problem that has to be solved, but there are things that do come up in the relationship that can be a problem and it requires two people to solve them. And, uh, I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm a problem solver by, by nature. So, um, 
I think she's uh, she fits the bill when it comes to joining the team of problem solving. We like to you know figure our, our stuff out. I was about to slip and say the <laughs> <laughs> say a, a no no word. <laughs> Gotta remember, I'm gonna be a dad soon. <laughs> Can't be cussing around my child. But yeah, but yeah, I like her. Yeah, she's cool. Uh, so I am a handyman, tradesman, um, do it all, Mr. Fix it kind of guy. Um, but even an electrician for short. Um, so prior to that, did a lot of work uh, in the retail space for a big box retailer. I'm not going to name names. Um, but after we parted ways, I went back to like my number one uh, thing, which was, you know, just, you know, again, problem solving, fixing things. Uh, and uh, it was electricity. Um, I have a, a huge fondness or, I guess, respect for um, the craft, the trade, um, it's very, very dangerous, uh, and it demands a lot of respect. Um, but to me, it's, it's, it's super fascinating because looking at diagrams, it's just like one big puzzle that you have to put together. So, yep. Shout out all of my peoples that are in the trades. Ooh, uh, what is the pro and con of working in trades? Um, well, a few cons, and it, it, it varies, you know, based on which one you're doing, like, you know, electrician, plumber, you know, pipe fitter, carpenter. Um, I guess it would have to be, like, no matter where you are, it would have to be just working in like inclement weather, um, just the environment overall, like if it's hot or if it's cold, um, you know, nobody cares if like it, it's cold out or if it's hot out, like, hey, this thing is broken. I'm going to pay you like a lot of good money to fix this thing. It's not ideal weather. Um, I think that's probably like the number one con. Um, outside of that, it can be very uh, physically taxing. Um, you know, if you're afraid of heights, you have to be on ladders a lot. Um, a couple months back, uh, I hung a chandelier. This guy has 20 foot ceilings. Uh, I, I really don't like being on ladders all that much. Um, but for something like that, it's like, you know, just get over it, suck it up, do it. You're going to get paid for it, whatever. And just take your time. That's the one thing too. Like people think it's like a rush, rush. Thing, it's it's okay to just you know err on the side of caution take your time and uh, do it safely because if you don't I mean what's the point of getting paid all that money if you fall and break your neck and can't spend it so um, I think one of the biggest pros is probably um, outside of like when you get to a point like the pay is really good Outside of that, I think the the biggest pro across all trades is just knowing that you have like a skill that everyone's always going to need. Like it's never going to be out of demand. Um, it can become like autonomous to a to an extent at some point, maybe down the future. But for the most part, you know that human hands have to fix this problem. Um, it's not one of those things where like chat GPT can't take your job. Um, so the job security, I think, is, is probably like the biggest thing. And uh, it's just knowing that like, hey, this is always going to be thing. like people will always need tradesmen. People will always need plumbers. People will always need electricians. And this is just one of those things that a robot or a computer cannot do. So I think a lot, that's a, a, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of um, you know men and women in their respective trades and disciplines kind of take pride in their work um, and saying that like, hey, this is what I do, and you know, I'm a pretty you know good electrician or tradesperson. So uh, just pacing yourself. Um, when it comes to 
anxiety situations, uh, one of the main things I like to do, um, especially if I'm working by myself, uh, I just pace myself, uh, give myself an outline of what it is that I'm doing, um, making sure that I'm not setting up unrealistic expectations for myself. Like if there's a job that has to be done in like in 12 hours, like 12 total billable hours, I'm not going to try and get it done in two. Uh, that's just unrealistic. But if I know that there's something that usually takes an hour, I can try and whittle that down to like 45 minutes. And there's nothing wrong with with doing that, but it's just knowing like how quickly and safely and efficient you can be. Um, if something has to take a specific amount of time, if you cannot rush it, then don't. Um, it just it just helps you when it comes to those things. And, you know, if you got to come back for a second or third day and say, like, hey, you know, Mr. 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 and Mrs. Client, um, this is taking a little bit longer than, you know, what I expected. I need to, uh, you know, do X, Y and Z. This is the progress that I've made. And um this is what I think will, you know, happen just because every project is, is different from the other, especially like service work. Um, it's, it's, it's different from each, each project. Um, and outside of that, I think it's going to just be music. Um, I know I work with my mentor sometimes, uh, a couple weeks ago, we, did this huge 85 inch TV install in this office building. Um, so that took us, you know, the entire Saturday to do. Um, Cause this is a big TV. And then also he had a bunch of like, uh, different things like a, a webcam for his like, you know, his uh, Zoom calls that he had to do in the office. He had a bunch of things to connect. He wanted to do power behind the TV, hide the wires, blah, blah, blah. Um, so he wanted the works and uh, yeah, I think the one thing that uh, helps us with, uh, you know, those high anxious moments or settings is probably just going to be music. Just get something you can jam to. Um, something that's just, you know, not crazy. Like, you know, playing like, you know, Gucci man or something like that. But like, I probably would, but like he won't, he's like older than me. But, you know, he always, you know, he's always, his go-to is like jazz or like, you know, like Sade or like Isley Brothers, you know, stuff like that. But, um, we're listening to some jazz, some, some smooth cuts, but, uh, but yeah, man, just jamming out to some, some old school jazz and just working it out and making it happen, getting it done. I think it probably would have been a few of my very, very first uh, security camera installations, um, which I was actually telling my mentor this uh, um, a while back. Uh, I did an install for a guy and it was for some security camera installation or for some security cams, um, some smart cameras. And I think it was a mix of me not asking enough questions and also the right questions, but the client not necessarily know what information to give me. So it's kind of like a like a, a perfect storm, so to speak of. Yeah. Clean the bottoms. No. Oh. Uh, just like a perfect storm of us not either asking or providing enough insight on the on the project and the result of that was that I had the block out um, more than a few days of my schedule to finish this project um, so it took me away from other clients <laughs> And they weren't happy about that because I had to reschedule on that and I tried not to reschedule on my end. It's okay if a client calls me and say, hey, can we reschedule? I'm like, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. But like, as the person doing the thing for a client and then calling and saying reschedule, like a lot, a lot of people are gonna 
they're going to crucify you for that. So, um, and then, then it comes down to the money aspect. Uh, I, I charged him based on something that I thought wouldn't take as long. And when we shook hands, it was, Hey, you're going to do this for this amount. And I said, yeah. And he was like, all right, no take backsies. And I'm just sitting there. I'm just like, dang, this is like eating into my budget and all this other stuff. I'm like, dang. But lessons were learned. Lessons were definitely learned. Um, the top three lessons that I learned from that moment, I would probably have to say just audit. Um, just auditing myself. Um, two was, well, actually, to just like expound on that, like auditing just may, mainly knowing what prices I set, um, if it's a good price, if it's a bad price, if the client feels that they got a really good deal, if they feel like they charged a lot more than what, the, you know, they are, you know, budgeting for. Um, are they expecting like a specific result within like a certain kind of, uh, you know, price range? Um, because the one thing is, you know, you can buy a steak from the grocery store or you can go to like Ruth Chris and you might pay specifically like, like significantly more for one thing than the other. Um, of course, it's going to be cheaper if you, you know, buy it and cook it yourself, but is it going to taste the same as if you go to the restaurant, the fancy restaurant that you're paying like, you know, 50, $60 for a glass of water. And did the expectations match the, the dollar amount of what this person spent? So it's kind of like shoes, like these shoes cost like. 200 bucks. Yeah, you can buy any pair of shoes for significantly less. You can go to Payless and spend $50 on some shoes that'll, you know, cover your feet and, you know, keep you from getting glass in your toes. But, you know, how much is it worth? And is there value behind that? And ultimately, that's that's going to be a, a big takeaway. Um, because if they do find value in, you know, the service that you provide, they're going to you know, they're going to call you back. They're going to, you know, ask you a ton more questions. They're going to like, you know, feel confident that they made the right choice and, you know, things like that. So, um, the second big le biggest lesson is to, um, that I learned with that would probably be just being a little bit more patient with myself uh, in terms of, uh, work balance, uh, because at that moment in time, I just left my retail gig and I was getting back into the swing of things of, you know, just finding work and taking on projects. And I was super heavy on just work, 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 work. I don't need to sleep. I just need to work as much as possible. And I really didn't take a whole lot of time out for myself. And I just started experiencing burnout. And it it got so bad where I would work super hard and then I'll come home and I would literally like walk through the kitchen after getting out the car and just pass out in the middle of the kitchen and just like it it looks like i i just like been murdered <laughs> i'm like like just super tired and it can easily play into what you do like your work um you can get sloppy at work you can you know miss a detail you can forget a thing you can be doing something relatively dangerous like being on a ladder and then if you lose your balance it's like one of those things where like you have to have that balance where yes it's good to have a good you know strong work ethic but at what cost like don't overwork yourself to the point where you're physically you know falling asleep and then i was driving a bunch and just like i remember one time like i i literally fell asleep like at the wheel and I'm like i'm so tired just working like up at eight 
back at 10 p.m. and just like just take time to you know relax don't overwork yourself um just be patient like everything doesn't have to get done in an instant um but yeah just the same as you know setting expectations with people you're working with or working for your team your your clients um setting realistic expectations and timeline not only for them but for yourself like what's going to be a good like mix that will not only satisfy my client but like also what's going to keep me from like losing my mind or you know burning myself out um and i think like the third thing is just double checking um if there are easier ways or easier methods um to doing things because i remember there was a uh at one point in the install he i think he had like maybe like four or five cameras he wanted to have installed and um there was one camera in one specific location that had um a lot of uh like wood molding around the area where i was going to be installing one of the cameras and i just completely like it just chunked out there's like wood splinters flying everywhere but i thought that i was doing it the right way come to find out there was a much easier way i'm over here with like a hacksaw just trying to like you know make the perfect circle and it's just chunks it's just like you know just blow out there's just like splinters everywhere i'm like I just could have, you know, used a whole saw, the same size, the correct size, appropriate size, you know, put it on reverse, spin it up, then back it out, then go to the other side, do the same thing. Would have had a very neat, uh, nice and neat, uh, very clean looking, uh, you know, work area. And I think after I made that error, I spent maybe an additional five hours just trying to make sure it looks nice and presentable and stuff like that i was like really like detail oriented i wanted to make it look nice but it was one of those things where like i i could have like taken a a little bit of extra time you know 10 15 minutes looked at it and just said hey i think there could be a better way other than the way that i think is the only way and yeah, it's just like, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, which is a weird saying because like, who's out here skinning cats? Like why, why are cats getting skinned? Like who does that? That's, don't skin cats, that's not, that's not. Um, not necessarily, at a certain point, I will say yes. Um, primarily because of social media. It's like everyone wants to, you know, have like the, you know, the baddest chick or like the freshest shoes or this and that and da 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 da. But I think it, like for good reasons, but some of, like, it depends on who you talk to. It may or may not be practical. Um, they're like, oh, just get it done. Like, just do it. It doesn't have to be like super pretty. It doesn't, it's not like on display. It's not going to go in a museum. Um, because a lot of the work is hidden. Like, you don't see it. You only like see the, the effect, which is, you know, the by, the byproduct. Um, but uh, there are a select few who will, you know, go in and then say doing service work, they, they know a good skilled person who's very detail oriented, who takes pride in what they do. And like, man, that's okay. All right. This person who did this and they sign off on it, man, they, they did a pretty good job. All the everything's nice and neat. Nothing's too short, or you know, all the everything's snug. Everything's like nice and crispy on here. And it's like, but you know, you can tell. You open up a couple panels, and you can see like a real, you know, dookie installer. And you know, open up another one, you see a really like just this person took some time to put that razzle dazzle on it, and you know. 
But yeah, there is a quite a bit of detail that goes into it, um, especially with like anything that's on the surface. Um, so like light fixtures, um, that's probably like the number one thing that you can see a lot of detail, um, or at least like, you know, there was some detail behind it. Um, anytime where I'm doing like, you know, home theater, uh, solutions or things like that, there's a lot of detail that I will always just, I will never not have any of those details in it that I feel that I would not not do for a client because I would not not do that for like my own thing because I want it to look a certain way. And sometimes they might not see it, but some do. And it's just like, it's like the extra cherry on top uh, when they do kind of notice those details. Like, oh, I see what you did there. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just kind of like fist bump yourself a little bit. And it's just like, yeah, 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 they noticed. <laughs> Ooh, the most difficult client. Ah, oh, man. Uh, I've had a couple Karens. Um, they were pretty difficult. Um, those are always just like the the worst. I had one lady, and I don't know. I I want to give her the benefit of the doubt, but this this is just what happened. Um she she invited me over to like you know install some equipment um that was going on her her back patio on like the deck um so you have the front of the house the driveway where i'm parked in her driveway and then like she has a bunch of neighbors um all of these houses are connected she's like maybe the fifth from the end and she's like can you walk around the house to the back and not through the house. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but it's right there. <laughs> like, it's just like, I was like, and, and I, I didn't really like, you know, jump to conclusions right then and there after she said that. I tried to like, you know, have like you know, a couple, you know, solutions in the back pocket, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, oh, well, I have like, you know, shoe covers uh, or I, I can take my shoes off if you want. Um, I just gotta like be back and forth you know, through the, you know, to get stuff from the, you know, my car and, you know, take it out to the back. And then she was like really adamant on me not walking through her house. <laughs> I'm like, why don't you want to, I'm like, okay, all right. And I'm like, ah, that's so wild. And then she was like, well, I can help you carry stuff from your car to the back. And then like, she was like grabbing stuff, I was like, oh yeah, just, you know, okay, cool, fine, whatever, it's your house, no big deal. And then, like she's grabbing stuff from the garage and from the, you know, from the driveway and from my car, and like, I'm grabbing like the heavier stuff, she's grabbing like the lighter stuff. And then like, I'm walking all around these five houses just to her back, you know, patio, and she's like walking through the house, and it's not like she has a dog or animal or anything like that, that she wants to not, have like escape and run around and stuff she doesn't even have a dog i'm like i can like what like and don't get me wrong this is like yeah some people are particular about like shoes in the house and things like that or like but i i think it's just kind of like because of the you know, the so because you were black yeah <laughs> <Say> <laughs> it, black. <laughs> yeah that was uh man that was a fun car ride home i felt uh I didn't feel too good about that driving home. I was like, man, people are still racist these days. Um, the taking their money part is kind of fun to me, so I, I guess I would say yeah. But um, it's it's always the it's always those things where it's just like I I try not to. I don't pity them. I don't envy them. Nor do I like condone their behavior or their actions or the things that you know how they think about people. Um, or their prejudices. Um, <clears throat> uh, I pray for them uh, that they can, you know, see the world, you know, how it is. You know, it's imperfect, but it it can be awesome at the same time. Um, but 
Um, yeah, uh, I like it, depending on what kind of day you catch me on, like I can easily turn into the CEO of Petty. Um, I can be like, yeah, I'm gonna charge you double for this. Yeah, so yeah, don't, yeah, don't, don't get it twisted. So, <laughs> I'm still gonna do a good job. Don't get me wrong, but I, I will definitely upcharge. Um, the three things that I learned from that interaction is that while it's good to walk around with like love and joy in your heart and care about your fellow man, not everybody is like gonna be like that just like the old adage like all skin folk ain't your kin folk um so it can be the same way with uh with you know other races or even like the same race as you as you but um it's just like a, a lot of times those people they have that 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 so much hatred in their heart that they don't want to admit that they're wrong or that they need a, another person that like when it comes to something that's like as important as like having working electricity, safe electric working electricity in their house that they're just going to be like super prejudiced. Like, Oh, I don't want this black person in my house to fix the thing that I need them to fix that they can fix, but I'm just too, you know, racist to let them fix it. It's, 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 it's super dumb, but it's not for me to worry my head about. Like I shouldn't be worried about that. That's something that they have to ultimately deal with um with themselves and you know if they believe in a higher power that they have to deal with and confront um when they get there but uh yeah just you know worry less um another thing that i learned from that is um it's okay to say no so just having the mentality that I had at that point, I was super adamant on, you know, saying yes to every client. Like, hey, do you do this? Yes. Hey, can you do this? Yes. And it's not it's not to say that saying yes is a bad thing, but saying no isn't a bad thing either. Um, because sometimes um, that no can save your life. Um, like if a person's uh, like if a like if a person's, um, you know, doing something that they shouldn't be doing and then like, uh, like, hey, you want to ride, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they got some illegal stuff going on and then you guys get pulled over or something happens. And then like you end up, you know, in a really dookie situation that like if you just said no, it's just like, you know, you know what, I'm going to just walk or I'm going to take an Uber, I'm going to take the bus you wouldn't be in that situation. So um, say, saying no sometimes can save your life. Um, and um, I think like the one thing I would say, the last thing that I learned from that situation is that ultimately people can be like, people can be their own judge of character. Um, you don't necessarily have to always correct them, um, but you can, you know, just by your your actions and your your demeanor and the the words that you you know you choose, um, you can be super nice and pleasant and, and still you know keep your faith. Um, yeah, you can still you know be a nice person, be a, a pleasant individual. Um, you can't you can't let someone's attitude or perception of you, even when you've been doing everything you know, right? You can't let them take you out of your good mood. Only you can do that. And when they see that you're continuing to be pleasant and just, you know, still uh, being nice to them, even after they've been so mean to you, uh, that actually speaks volumes to your character saying that like, hey, uh, you're being racist or you're being unpleasant or you being rude or you're being disgusting human being i'm still going to treat you with love and respect because that's that's how i was brought up and it might not feel good in the moment yeah like no one likes to be called names especially like you know racial slurs and stuff like that by a person that thinks that they're just like so much better than them but like it speaks more to your character 
if you're able to go through that and still uh, still have a smile on your face, still treat them pleasant, still you know be an overall nice individual to them. So they're gonna feel like a dookie person. They're like, man, I was super racist to that guy. He just told me to you know have a nice day. He was saying, you know, thank you, sir, and you know told me to you know God bless me. I was like, wow. I was like, I need to I need to fix myself. I need to work on myself a little bit. So yeah, it's a day in my shoes.